This is a paid advertisement from BetterHelp Therapy Online. Have you ever struggled from fitting in? I know I have, particularly at school. I found it difficult to find out who I was on that journey of self-discovery. I started to see a therapist, and not only did I go on a journey of self-awareness and understanding, I became more resilient, my self-worth grew, and my mental health changed for the better. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try, because it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. With over 1,000 therapists in the UK already, BetterHelp can provide access to mental health professionals with a wide variety of expertise in mental health. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash headstrong. That's better, H-E-L-P, dot com slash headstrong. Hello and welcome to Headstrong. My name is Louis Strong and I host this podcast. Headstrong is a podcast where I sit down with a number of individuals in the public eye and talk to them about their lives and their careers, but notably I want to talk to them about their vulnerabilities to understand what the word headstrong means to them. On today's episode is Tara Norris, a professional cricketer who is taking the cricket world by storm. We had a chat about the Ashes, her predictions, as well as her experiences with travelling and what that feels like leaving your family and friends at home. So I really hope you enjoy this episode of Headstrong. Tara, thank you so much for joining me on Headstrong. How's it going? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm really, really good, thank you. No, it's great to have you on. And it's um, lovely to... I, what I really like is talking to to more women in the game, in the cricket game, because... You know, the way that the sport is growing um, in terms of how much more opportunity there is around the world in terms of franchise cricket. It's so exciting for you. And we were just chatting that you've just come back from training. So what does kind of like a typical day look like for you now, you know, with the build up to the summer and, depth, you know, obviously with games kind of cracking on now? Yeah, I guess right now, yeah, we're we're three rounds into our 50 over comp. Um, so we've got training, like cricket skills, three times a week. So we've got a game tomorrow. So today is kind of just top-ups, um, getting what you need done so you're ready for tomorrow. Um, a little gym session, like a more like speed power focus. And then a bit of lunch, a little team meeting, and just make sure everyone's really clear on our plans for tomorrow. All right. That sounds very good. How, how how are you the night before a game? Do you get excited or are you nervous? Um, night before, I'm pretty good. Maybe the morning, I'll have a few little nerves, um, which not, not necessarily a bad thing. But yeah, night before, try and keep, try and not do too much. Um, get a nice early night, cook a nice meal. Um, and then, yeah, normally the day of or the morning, if I feel a little bit jittery, uh, that's normally a good sign. Yeah, I I always think if you're not nervous, there's usually something wrong. I think a few nerves yeah, actually I get, really build yeah, it up. Completely. Yeah, completely. I manage- get worried if I don't get nervous. Yeah, yeah. How do you manage your nerves? You know, if like it's too much, because sometimes it can affect your performance, right? So how do you I, like stay on top of that and manage it? Do you do anything to kind of keep them under control? Or is it all in the practice um, in the week? I guess you've got to trust that, like hopefully I know that I've done everything this week to put me in the best position tomorrow and walk off knowing that I've done everything I can. Um, so I guess there's an element of trust knowing that you've done everything you can. Um, the second part, yeah, if I get too nervous, it it's really not good for me. Um, but I think when you're a little bit on edge, a little bit anxious, a little bit, uh, I guess you're just superb, like, yeah, you're really you're high sensitive so you're really aware mm. of what you're feeling and thinking and for me I think I play so much better because I'm constantly thinking rather than if I'm a little bit too plaze um maybe a little yeah. bit too relaxed it's not always good for me but um I've started taking cold showers in the morning sometimes on a game day just to get that feeling of like I'm awake 
Um, mm. I used to do it quite a bit when I'd get nervous to bat. And I'd find I'd have quite a similar, like, physiological response when I got to bat. Like, I'd be quite, quite jittery. My movements are really fast. My heart is absolutely racing. Um, like, you would if you got into cold water. You jumped in the sea, jumped in the, in the cold shower. Um, so I did that a little bit last year, actually, and I found that was quite helpful. But this year, um, I actually haven't done it this year so far. I don't know, I really like that. I think um, a cold shower is so good for... I mean, obviously, there's loads of research in it, right? But I, for me, it's just very much like you're. It brings you very much back down to the moment, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, you literally you, can't think about anything else apart up. from yeah, literally, yeah. Or you can think right. about how cold the water is, or yeah, yeah. Um, so we found a lot ourselves... of the girls actually. Sorry, no, go on. I was going to say a lot of a lot of my teammates actually really into that sort of stuff. A lot of like cold water therapy. We talk about it quite a bit. Uh, I know quite a few players that are yeah really into it, or people that have even gone and bought their own like cold water plunge. Yeah, I think yeah, loads of people are doing the cold water plunges now, and I yeah. I, I really want to get into it. And I was speaking to um I was speaking to someone I interviewed the other day who does it every single day, and I said, do you ever get used to it? Really? He goes, nope, nope. But I force myself to do it every really? day because I know the benefits. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, the studies so we, for like longevity are brilliant as well. I know it's so so good for the health and 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 the mind, obviously. But we find ourselves now um, at the beginning of the summer, which is incredibly exciting for both men and women cricket in England specifically, though, because obviously it's an Ashes summer, which is very exciting. Now, let I want to I want to hear your predictions <laughs> for both the men's game and the women's game. Because obviously oh. you will have shown a keen interest. I'm not going to hold you to it, but go on. Get, let's hear your thoughts. Predictions. Um, do you know, I'm actually really... Well, I think the men's Ash is going to be unbelievable. Um, I'm not sure on results. I think obviously we've got an advantage of being a home Ashes. Um, but I think the style of cricket is going to be unbelievable. Like, it's going to be entertaining. Um and I think I th hopefully the attitude that obviously England men are having now is even if, you know, a game's lost or a, a test is lost, I think the style will be brilliant. Um, the women's ashes, I think, will be really, really interesting. Um, obviously, a few new faces about this year, a few youngsters. Mm. Um, and I, hopefully, I think, yeah, we can get one up in the Aussies quite early. Um, I think that test match will be brilliant. Um, I believe yeah. it could be a four-day test match now. I don't know if that's definite. Um but I've heard rumors it's now maybe going to be a four-day test match, which is brilliant. Um, so yeah, I think regardless, it's going to be it's going to be really exciting. A few new faces about. Um, so yeah, hopefully I can go down and watch a little bit of it. So I read that it's going to be five days, and the first five-day test match on home soil, and their first visit for the women back to Trent, Trent Bridge since two thousand. Five days. Just yeah. Yes, sorry, five days. Very exciting. Um, and obviously, Which is brilliant. I mean, all of these things, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's pretty historic relentlessly now in terms of the women's game, in terms of what's happening, uh, you know, with all the, fran the growth of franchises around the world and the more test cricket that's being played, the more money that's being put into the women's game. That, I mean, it, it's just, it's pretty mind blowing that it's now coming up to, quite literally we look at the hundred that they're now on a par you know it's completely level playing field which is super exciting right yeah absolutely and I think yeah you look the growth of women's game in the last five years the last three years with domestic contracts coming in and all these franchises um I think that was a stat I think behind women's football I think female cricket is one of the highest paying salaries in women's sport um wow. which is brilliant for the sport and it's brilliant for you know inspiring young players who actually can yeah, sort of see their role models and, and have an ambition to play professional sport. My question to you is, is the growth of these franchises developing the sport or hindering it from a kind of a true sporting perspective? Because we look at cricket and you look at the true form of cricket that people love to talk about, test cricket. But is the growth of yeah. the kind of franchise, the franchises around the world, is that kind of hindering the game or is that helping develop it? What do you think? Um, it depends if you're a traditionalist or not, I guess. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think the style obviously they're playing now in Test cricket is, I think it's pretty exciting. It's pretty fun to watch. Um, I guess maybe that's a new generation thing 
game potentially. Um, in terms of women's sport, I guess because we've never had longer format or more traditional cricket, this is probably um, our only style of cricket. Yeah, I think if they introduced longer format for the women's game, it would be brilliant. Um, mm. Maybe not loads of it, but definitely some sort of league. If they introduce it in England, I think, again, that's you're just attracting a different crowd. Um, are you hindering it? Potentially there's talks of um, like just franchise, one-year franchise contracts going and obviously, I know particularly in the women's game, a lot of um, international players have retired from international cricket and are just playing franchise cricket, um, which, again, is a different topic, a different subject overall. Um, I don't know, but I think the awareness and the, the coverage from women's sport is definitely not a bad thing at all. One thing I need to ask you is, and I know that obviously it's difficult, so don't answer it if you don't need to answer it, but we're looking at the 100 specifically, and... I think from my understanding of the 100 is there was definitely hope that potentially other countries might pick up, pick it up as a format and therefore it would develop around the world. But with all the franchises, with T20, even T10, England is still very much the only place that is playing the 100. Is there a future for the 100 or do we need to re-evaluate what that format looks like? Um. I think I quite like that it's the only country that has this pretty unique sport or I guess unique style of cricket. Um, it's obviously branded completely different. It's still mm. very similar T20 cricket. Um, I think if I'm being honest, the, the T20 blast is maybe a little bit outdated. You look at other countries, Big Bash, IPL, um, the CPL. Um, for me, they're potentially more exciting T20 comps. Um from a, I guess, a woman's game point of view, um, like it's brilliant for us. We, I think that's what the women's game really needs. And I don't think we can do that without the men's and sort of vice versa as well in terms of like crowds, numbers, TV coverage. Um, the, I think, again, it's unique in the point of you've got a men and women's franchise team now. Um, so you don't just buy your ticket for one game. You're, you're buying all in for, for your whole franchise and you're watching both teams. Um, I think definitely short term, three to five years, definitely. Longer, I'm I'm not too sure to be honest. I guess it depends on reviews, how many tickets we sell, revenue, things like that. Um, from a cricket perspective, though, I think for the women's game, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Now, one thing that we need to talk about is travel as a professional cricketer. Because, I mean, even right now, like, you are you spend time away with the way matches, but then also you know the opportunities with these franchises opening up around the world. I mean, travel can have a quite a tiring effect on you as an individual, missing family, missing your friends, missing your partner, you know, missing like your life at home. What's your kind of experience been with that? Do you get homesick and does that affect you mentally, or are you quite good at staying in touch and keeping grounded and rallying around as a team? Uh, I think it's a tricky one. I think if your cricket's going well, being away is the best thing ever. You're with your mates, you're playing well. If you're abroad, you're in usually a hot country. Um, you're normally doing pretty like new experiences, um, experience different culture. If you're not playing well, that's when it can get pretty tough. Um, and I've sort of, I guess I've sort of lived through both those experiences, really. Um, on the one hand, yeah, you're away, you're on cloud nine, playing well, your team's winning. There's not a lot that can go wrong um if, if you're not playing well uh, family or i tend to um what's the word i'm looking for like distance myself from teammates yeah family friends um so yeah it can be draining and i guess if you're away for a long period of time um it can get much harder um i guess for me it's yeah keeping in touch with family and and i guess talking to your teammates when it is a little bit rough um, but I think that's always the way. It's always much easier when you're winning. Um, yeah, yeah when you're course. losing, it can be pretty relaxed. Is there anything that you take with you that's kind of like your your home piece, your home away from home kind of item or or something that you take, like tea bags or a teddy? I don't know. Like, what is it? Um, if I go away, like abroad, I'll take some some little herbal tea bags with me. And then if we're just like, we've just got back from, where do we go? I went to Cardiff and Nottingham last weekend. So I just took my pillow with me just so I can sleep on the bus. And then if you're staying in a hotel room, like you want to have your own pillow and yeah, it sort of feels a little bit homely. 
there's literally nothing better than your own pillow. It's so true. Like yeah, you stay exactly. at a hotel and it's just like you got this rock hard thing, or it's like it's yeah, it's like, like a piece cardboard. of cardboard. Oh yeah, oh. definitely. No, so I, yeah, I they're probably the two understand. things. No, absolutely. I mean, are you quite good at staying in touch then? Because I know it's difficult. Let's say things are not going well. I mean, you were saying there that you distance yourself. Do you find it difficult to reach out? And on the other hand as well, do you think that you wear it, obviously, in front of your housemates? Like you you kind of are a recluse and you go inside yourself slightly? Is it, Do you think it's quite obvious to others? Yeah, I'd say generally I'm... I'm pretty extrovert and I like to be around people um definitely like my own time when it's needed but generally 80 percent I like to be around people um so it's probably noticeable from that point of view if I'm yeah pretty quiet and I want to spend a lot of time by myself um I guess yeah when you're around family as well if you're away and there's a time zone like I find sometimes that it's really hard just to factor in a bit of time to speak to family obviously you're the occasional message here and there but it's actually quite hard to speak um if you obviously different ends of in different ends of the world um but yeah I think, I think it probably is a little bit noticeable around teammates and that's when you've just got to get out your room basically get out the hotel room do something or speak with somebody or go for a coffee or like we stayed on the we literally stayed on the m1 in a a, a hotel on the m1 last weekend so there wasn't a lot going on um so mm. some girls did a bit of shopping um a few of us got an uber into nottingham so there's a bit of normality there you you're not just stuck in a hotel room in sort of the middle of nowhere, really. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I think sometimes when I when I have spoken to a couple of the guys, especially when they did COVID bubbles, it's like, how do you get away from yeah. cricket? How do you switch off? Is there anything that you do specifically kind of to switch off? You, I mean, you say that you're kind of a people person. You like to hang around your teammates and chat to your family and friends. But is there anything that you do as well to kind of, look after your mental health? Like, do you do any breathing exercises? You talk about the cold water showers, which is cool. Is there anything else that you do? Um, do you know, I've got like a love-hate relationship with meditation. Like I know it's really good for me. I just find it really hard to get into a routine and especially if it's not like a familiar environment, I find that really hard just to more mm. just be really strict myself and just do it. Um, so again, I know that's really good for me, but I wish I did it a bit more. I, I tried to, but... Um, yeah, getting the routine is quite hard. Um, yeah, switching up, I think, is, again, one of those things. When you're winning, you don't feel like you need to think about the game. You just kind of park your past performance and get ready for the next game. I guess when you're losing, and I guess the situation we're in now, we've lost two games um, on the bounce, and, and our third game has rained off. So you, you overthink everything, or I definitely have the last last few days. Um, overthink your own performance, what you could have done better, how as a team we can be better. Um, and it can be draining at times. Um, in downtime, what do I do? If, um, me and my housemate have a rule. So we obviously train together, play together, and we just have like a no cricket chat time. And it's like, right, we cannot talk about cricket. I'm I'm done. I'm going to park the last game or park the session. Like we'll put our phones off, um, turn our phones off and just not talk about cricket. We'll speak about anything. Um, so, yeah, we tend to do that sometimes. Um I do a little bit of watercolouring every now and then, which is quite nice. Oh, um, very nice. For me, that's, for me, like, that's my sort of mindfulness. Um, it's the only time where I'm I'm pretty still. I can sit still, be quiet, and switch off for a couple hours and, yeah, put some music on and just kind of try and – I mean, they're not very good, but I quite enjoy it. Well, I think that's ultimately what it, what it comes down to, isn't it? If it works for you, then – it doesn't matter what, what what anyone else thinks about them yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. it is. You know what I mean? It's really nice. And either way, I'm sure mum will put one on the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> this is a paid advertisement from BetterHelp Therapy Online. Have you ever struggled from fitting in? I know I have, particularly at school. I found it difficult to find out who I was on that journey of self-discovery. I started to see a therapist. And not only did I go on a journey of self-awareness and understanding, I became more resilient, my self-worth grew, and my mental health changed for the better. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try, because it's entirely online. 
It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. With over 1,000 therapists in the UK already, BetterHelp can provide access to mental health professionals with a wide variety of expertise in mental health. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash headstrong. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash headstrong. Something I did want to mention and discuss with you is kind of cricket as, because I was actually talking about, I was listening to a podcast, sorry, earlier where cricket is actually the second biggest sport in the world, which is crazy to think of when places like America don't even, don't even necessarily play it to the extent that it could well be played like baseball or basketball or American football. Yeah. But as a space for inclusivity, cricket has got that enormous opportunity to bring people together. And we look at the IPL in terms of what that looks like. But then also the way that it's kind of been portrayed in the media with the likes of the scandals that have been taking place in the UK could potentially be having a negative effect in the UK on the game of cricket. What do you think about that? It's a bit of a tricky one. Um, yeah, if you're looking at inclusivity, I think well, number one, team sports are always are always the best sports. Uh, um, obviously, um, I think there's a lot of charities like Chance to Shine, which have which was the charity that got me involved in cricket. Mm. Um, I know there's All Stars. There's all sorts of little like junior, junior cricket club setups. Um, which I think from a young age, it, it, like for me, when I got into cricket, it was purely a way to make friends when I moved to new school. Um, that was the only reason I joined, because I didn't have any friends, basically. Um, got pumped into an after school, after school club, chance to shine. Um, and for me, that was a bit of a release and, yeah, a chance to meet new people. Um, so I guess you look at inclusivity from a young age and developing skills, teamwork, um, actually refined skills as well, like batting and bowling and actually, yeah, working the team and maybe a bit of leadership as well. I think brilliant. Um, obviously, yeah, there have been a few scandals and I guess scandals all over the world. There's also things like yeah. match fixing, which obviously take place, um, which is not just in cricket and kind of all sports. Um, and I guess that's that's one of the the sort of negatives to sport and I guess elite sport. Um, not that I necessarily agree with it, but I, yeah, I know it does happen. I guess that's never going to change. It's always going to be a part of something as for as long as kind of sport as you say exists now what let's look at kind of you getting into into cricket and talking about that because I know that you spent some of your formative years growing up in Spain is that right yeah I grew up in uh, Barcelona oh I was just in Barcelona I loved it but have you ever played cricket oh, nice. did you like for example play cricket in Barcelona you know like is it even a thing John yeah. I'm pretty sure Spain have a like a national team. Um, no way. In like a European cricket league, I'm sure. But no, I never played as a kid. Um, yeah, I think you should look it up. I'm not sure what the standards are like, but they've definitely. I'm sure they've got a team. Um, but yeah, no, didn't play cricket until I moved to the UK. Um, we did a lot of like tennis at school, swimming, football, like sort of classic PE sports, I guess. Are you a left-handed tennis player as well? I am a left hand, not a very good one, but yeah, I, I play <laughs> left handed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, but I always think that that's such a good, um, it's such a good, like an additional benefit to a sport. Everyone's like, wait, well, not a left hander? No. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I, I don't think I'd be where I was today if I wasn't left handed. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, definitely got a few advantages. Um, yeah, sure. So when you got into cricket then, so you moved to England and you, uh, kind of wanted to wanted to make some friends was that a personal choice was that coming from someone telling you you needed to go make some new amigos or was this kind of you being somewhat headstrong being like I'm going to do this for myself um I think it was a case of so I think Travis Shine came to the primary school I was at and it was part of a PE lesson and I think I picked it up okay like, like I enjoyed it um and then I'm sure they said, look, we're doing after school clubs. Why don't you come join? And I think someone in my class said, oh, you're going to do the after school club. And I thought, yeah, why not? I'll give it a go. Um, 
and I think as a kid I've always been yeah I've always liked being around people and always I feel like as a kid I made friends quite easily um and always a little bit curious and yeah just sort of want to see what it's about um and yeah joined their school club and really enjoyed it and they put me in touch with a local girls club um and then I just didn't yeah from there it kind of just I just kept going kept playing um got involved at county level at Sussex and then just worked my way up the pathway really can you remember that first phone call where you were told right this is your opportunity as a profession you know do you remember that moment and I imagine that elation and that feeling of joy yeah it was actually like the peak of lockdown peak of covid it was Summer 2020, they'd released professional contracts. Um, so nobody even thought there'd be cricket that year. Um, so I was still at university. Literally, I was handing in my, like, finishing my dissertation. Um, I was still at uni in lockdown with my housemates. I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, and pretty much the same week that I submitted my dissertation and had finished and pretty much graduated, um, yeah, I got a phone call from sorry that's my hearing um my home domestic team offering me a professional contract and honestly I was absolutely gobsmacked um it was pure surprise me because it was this brand new thing they were introducing contracts there was rumors there might be contracts but I don't think anyone thought it would happen that quickly really especially in the middle of a pandemic when you obviously budgets were tight and no um Given out, yeah, nobody really knew where these contracts came from. So, yeah, a lot of surprise, but yeah, just pure elation and I guess relief as well. Playing a sport such a long time and looking to play professionally. Um, obviously, at that point as well, like a lot of um, postgraduates, it was the question of, well, am I going to work full time? Like, how am I going to manage mm. training full time plus a job? I'm going to have to move back home and all those really like uncertain questions that you know a lot of postgraduates have. Um, so definitely. Yeah, definitely a massive sense of relief for me. Well, did you have that a real sense of anxiety then prior to the, being awarded that contract because of that uncertainty? Yeah, definitely. It was. It was well for me. I just thought I'm gonna have to work full time here. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to earn money somehow. I'm gonna have to move back home. I might have to coach and then train by myself. Or there was a lot of. I thought I was gonna maybe have to do a masters just so I could prolong the the adulting for a little bit more um <laughs> definitely a, yeah a lot of questions going around what it's going to do really um yeah well previously to to play professional cricket you had to play for England um so yeah the con the contracts they brought in there's obviously a few more contracts now has definitely taken the pressure off a lot of players sort of yeah from my age of finishing university um but for players now who've just finished like college that can go straight into full-time cricket a full-time job and yeah the pressures that it takes off certainly financially um is massive you've had some pretty incredible moments and I particularly think about playing at Lords in front of a huge crowd what how do you manage and cope with that because I always think that actually performing in front of such huge crowds is actually happens very few and far between for a very select amount of people so how do you kind of manage though that that kind of atmosphere and nerves for a day like that because it's all very well and good going into a match but then knowing that there are 20,000 people is absurd yeah do you know no one ever tells you how you deal with it either no one really gives you much advice um to be honest it sounds cliche but once you're like in the game you can hardly notice it or oh matter. um like, I think it motivates me a bit more. And it's, I quite like having a crowd um, because the crowd are into it. Like, everyone's excited for the game. Um, there's a little bit of pressure. Like, it makes me a bit more nervous, which I think makes me play better. Um, but I think, like, when you're in the heat and you're in the battle, like, it's all sort of background noise. I, I honestly think, like, you just zone into what you're trying to do. Um, and it can be quite funny at times, sorry. It can be quite funny at times when, you know, you can hear certain funny things or funny comments in the crowd. Um, and it sort of lights the mood a little bit. Um, but no one, I guess, really told me or my teammates how you deal with it. I think you've just got to really embrace it and sort of look around and think, wow, like you're actually playing at a, a sold out ground. Um, or certainly for me, like I remember watching 
the England women win the World Cup there in 2017. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm actually playing playing a lot. Like that's a massive pinch me moment. That you're playing at a brilliant stadium and a sold out ground. You're only 24 as well. So obviously you've got so much left in your cricketing career and then everything else thereafter as well. What are those goals for you in your <laughs> cricketing career? What kind of are those things that are on the horizon that you feel like you want to achieve? Um, definitely would love to play a bit more franchise cricket and, and play a bit more abroad. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, you get to play with some world-class players. Um, and you get to avoid the English winter, which is pretty good fun. <laughs> um, I guess right now, domestic, my domestic team, like, would love to qualify for finals days, hopefully pick up some silver in the next 12 to to two years. Sorry, 12 months to, to two years. Um, but yeah, right now, very much, I know if I think about too many things in the future, then I'll get caught up in that. So it's very much, a, t it sounds, again, a bit cliche, but take each game as it comes. Like, how can you win the game today? How can you win that moment in the match? Um, and I think, yeah, if collectively we do well domestically, um, I think it will hopefully lead to those other opportunities down the line. No, I think you make a really good point. I think it's really important. Whilst you can get carried away and have all these goals, actually you've got to focus on very much the present and near future and take each hurdle as it comes. Because as much as we can be ambitious and think, yes, yeah, so in three years' time, I want this, we need to make sure that we can... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely achieve, uh, you know, uh, to achieve the I mean, it's goal, definitely, it's definitely easier said than done. Like, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so guilty of doing that all the time. Like, I've got myself into such a state thinking, oh, my God, I'm not going to play in this tournament or, or I'm not going to bowl in the 100 or I'm not going to do X, Y, Z. And it's like, Tyra, it's January. Like, don't worry, you're, you're training indoors. It, this is irrelevant now. Or it's April, <laughs> May time now. Like, it's... These things are three, four months ahead of you. You can't control any of that right now. All you can control is what you're doing now. But I'm definitely guilty of that, for sure. So to, uh, one question that I ask everyone, Tara, is what does the word headstrong mean to you? It's fun, actually, when I when I talk to someone on the phone or um, any sort of birthday card she writes to me, she always says, keep strong in your body, mind and spirit. She always says that. Um, it's like she signs it off like that. I don't know why. Um, so it kind of reminds me of that. Like just, I think keeping strong and keeping like um, almost like healthy in your mind. And I really think like if you're looking after your mind, your well-being, the physical stuff and everything else will take place. You're a, you're a human being first. You're not an athlete first. Um, so looking after your mind and, and really just taking care of yourself and, Again, yeah, not worrying about performance side or if it's your career, whether it's sport or not. Um, but yeah, taking a bit of time out and and not even like a mental toughness or resilience point of view, more just a, like your actual health, um, feeling mentally fit, feeling like your mental well-being strong. You've got good connections around people. Um, for me, yeah, that's that's headstrong. No, I really like that answer. I think you're absolutely right. I really like it when people, you know, professional sports people say, I'm a person before I'm the athlete, because actually you'd rather be judged on yourself as a person than your performance on the pitch. You know what I mean? Definitely. I, I really think when people retire, they, yeah, you've off the pitch as well. Um, and I think you always carry that reputation around you. You could be the most successful player in the world, and win all these medals and trophies, but as long as you've got to be happy with who you are and, and sort of the person that you, you show to people, I think. No, I, I love that. Tara, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I've really no, thank you for having you. me. And I wish you the best of luck for this season. And I hope that thank we, you, very uh, much. You, you have so much huge success and you take some serious in-swinging Yorker wickets. <laughs> I'll try my best, thank you. This is a paid advertisement from BetterHelp Therapy Online. Have you ever struggled from fitting in? I know I have, particularly at school. I found it difficult to find out who I was on that journey of self-discovery. I started to see a therapist, and not only did I go on a journey of self-awareness and understanding, 
I became more resilient, my self-worth grew, and my mental health changed for the better. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try because it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. With over 1,000 therapists in the UK already, BetterHelp can provide access to mental health professionals with a wide variety of expertise in mental health. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash headstrong. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash